Do you mind closing that door? Thank you. So, you know when we attend funerals, especially of people who have lived a long life, there's usually a time for a person to give a eulogy, or sometimes there's an open mic time that people, family and friends, can come up and talk about the wonderful things that the deceased person had done in his or her lifetime. It's so nice to have that at funerals. And some people have accomplished so many things. It's very impressive to hear about all the amazing things that they had done in their lifetime. All the many, many things that they have accomplished. There's one in the Bible, one person in the Bible who had a long list of accomplishments as well, and this is Solomon. He was an author, a poet, a politician, a diplomat, a philanthropist, an architect, an engineer. He was a very successful and very accomplished man. And in the book of 2 Chronicles chapter 1, it explains that when Solomon inherited the kingdom from his father, David, God appeared to him in a vision. And God told Solomon, it's really interesting, God told Solomon, you can ask of me whatever you want, and I will give it to you. Can you imagine if God asked us that same question, whatever you want, ask me and I will give it to you? Can you imagine? Think of that for a minute. If God asked you, Linda, Rose, you can ask me Whatever you want, go ahead and ask me. What would you ask for? I want you to think about that. Anything, anything you want. What would you ask? Well, Solomon said, Give me wisdom and knowledge that I may go out and come in before this people. That's what Solomon asked for. That shows he had great character. He could have asked God for anything, but Solomon asked for wisdom and knowledge that he could rule the kingdom of God's people well. So Solomon was telling God, give me wisdom and knowledge because I'm feeling overwhelmed. I need you so that I can rule your people. That is true humility. Now be honest with me. When I asked you if you could ask God for anything, did you think to ask God for wisdom and knowledge? I'm sure your thoughts varied. Oh, I probably would have asked for a good thyroid so I don't have to go through surgery maybe. I don't know, maybe some of you asked, uh, let's see, for to look younger, to be younger, to have more money, have a nice fancy car or a bigger house. Maybe if you're single you might ask for a wife or a husband. 
Maybe some of you even thought of, I'd like to have superhero power or to become the richest person in the world. I don't know what, were you, what you were thinking. But a thousand years after Solomon had asked God for wisdom in order to rule the kingdom successfully, another descendant of David, whose name is James, wrote, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who will give to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Isn't that great? 1,000 years later, another descendant of David wrote, if you lack wisdom, ask God, and he will generously, he will happily give you wisdom. And wisdom is so important for our lives. Today, this morning's text that Ben just signed for us talks about contrast two different people and two different characteristics. One, a person who lacks God's wisdom, and the other is a person who has received wisdom of God, the wise and the unwise. So, we just recently saw in verse 13 that James challenges us. If you have wisdom, if you have the wisdom of God, prove it. Prove it by living an honorable life and by doing good. And living humbly. I love that. That is a challenge for us. If you think that you have wisdom, prove it. Prove it. And you can prove it with your life, that you're walking rightly and humbly with God. I'm sure that we all like to think of ourselves as being wise, and knowledgeable, especially those of us who are getting up there in years, right? Those of us who are in our 50s and 60s and 70s, we say that, but James says, if you're wise, prove it. And you can show people through your behavior. And when we see people, we, can, we recognize them immediately. James says first that people who are wise, so the next slide, right here, yes. If a person feels they are wise, they should show it with good behavior, which means that your lifestyle that you're currently living has changed from the past life that you lived before you meet Jesus, knew Jesus. So our life after accepting Jesus should be different. It should be changed. So a person who has wisdom must look different than they did before they had accepted Jesus. So that's one thing, that's one way that we prove wisdom. And second, the life of a wise person demonstrates obedience to God's word. If you're wise, your lifestyle, you living in truth, and that proves that you have wisdom. And then second, a person who is wise, wise walks humble humbly. This is a kind of gentleness, and I think many people today that think gentleness is a sign of weakness, but that's not true. Gentleness <laughs> is a, related to a fruit of the Spirit that we read about in Galatians chapter 5, verse 23. A 
gentleness is very closely related to self-control. And self-control is evident of biblical wisdom. So when we are looking for a good preacher or teacher, Christian counselor or friend, we tend to gravitate towards people that are educated and smart. And that's okay. Degrees in training are wonderful if the lifestyle follows biblical principles with a humble attitude. Without that, without humility, the education is worthless. In fact, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 24, Paul explains, I think I have a slide here, Paul explains that a leader should be kind, be able to teach, and be patient. So education must include kindness and patience as well. And then in verses 14 and 16, James shifts his focus from describing, to describe the signs of the unwise person. And he says, an unwise person is bitter and jealous and have selfish ambition. And these influence our lives greatly. Bitter jealousy is a jealousy that harbors hard feelings. Jealousy means that a person feels his accomplishments, her belongings are threatened by another person's success. And that you're unable to be happy for other people. Bitter jealousy and selfish ambition is everywhere. Even in the church, preachers, teachers, missionaries, worship leaders, youth pastors. There's so much competition. It's terrible. Terrible. James lists five characteristics of fake wisdom. Fake wisdom means the flesh is controlling rather than God's wisdom. And James lists the characteristics of what this fake wisdom looks like. First, next slide. First, it is arrogant, which involves two things. First, it means a person puts themselves above others or feels better than another. And second, it's used as a way to justify sinful actions. I know it's wrong, but I have a good reason. Rather than accepting, I made a mistake, I'm a sinner, instead, they will make up excuses. I have a good reason. There is no good reason for sin. And that is a sign of arrogance. And the second characteristic is lying. Next slide. The truth is the truth, and the truth will set you free. Today we battle even more with the changing standards of today's society. We see more and more Christians and Bible teachers inventing man-made doctrines that don't align with God's Word, which is sad. So that's lying. And third, a third characteristic of false wisdom is earthly. This is really simple to understand. We cannot have wisdom if we're always concerned with earthly standards of success, materialism, 
or earthly priorities. With these, you cannot have wisdom. After we accept Jesus, our priorities change. And fourth is, a, is unspiritual. This characteristic means we apply our inner human motives and follow our own thoughts, our own interests, our own pursuits, not the Spirit's wisdom and His guidance. And the fifth characteristic of the unwise is demonic. This doesn't always mean that worldly wisdom comes from demonic beings. Rather, it means this kind of wisdom is so contrary to God's truth that Satan himself would support it. James says in verse 4, 16 that all these unwise character flaws will lead to disorder and every kind of evil. There will be no peace in your home and in your life and your marriage and your any relationships. But then in the last two verses, verses 17 and 18, James returns his focus to godly wisdom. And he says, a wise life is truly rewarding and amazing. You will begin to experience peace in your home, in your life, and in your marriage, and in relationships when we follow God's wisdom. And then he lists eight characteristics of godly wisdom. And the first is purity. God-given wisdom produces spiritual purity of our internal motives and our external actions. Jesus says, Blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. And second, God's wisdom is peace-loving. God-given wisdom produces peaceful relationships. Do you get that? We're supposed to have peaceful relationships. Did you know that? Relationships between a husband and a wife, between the children, mother-in-law, father-in-law. You know how we often say, you know, things against our mother-in-law or whatever. I know my mother-in-law may say, or my daughter-in-law may say that about me, I don't know. But I work very hard to produce a peaceful relationship with people. Our natural tendencies are to be argumentative, but that's earthly. Our earthly tendencies to be argumentative, belligerent, hot-headed, and not listen to each other. But God, when we have His Spirit within us, is not arg argumentative, it's not hot-headed. That is not from God, that is not His wisdom. In Matthew 5, verse 9, Jesus says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Isn't that cool? And now, the third one, that James mentions is gentleness. God-given wisdom produces gentleness. This describes a person who surrenders his or her right 
to chase perfection. Just surrenders the perfection to develop this gentle spirit and gentle lifestyle. And number four, James says, we will yield to others. God-given wisdom produces the ability to be When we hear somebody who maybe criticizes us, we are open to being teachable and to accepting their suggestions. Maybe critical ideas or whatever might open up the opportunity for great change and improvement. But I'm not talking about ungodly wisdom of judgment and criticism and complaint. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about with your husband or your wife when they have a need or a desire or a success, a suggestion to just sit down and listen to it and think about it. And same with relationships with other people, maybe with your boss or supervisor. Maybe you've been resistant that's caused a lot of conflict. But God's wisdom, the gentleness, we're willing to yield to others and to improve and to listen to what they might have to say. It's a fact. Fact. I can be better at everything. I admit it. I need to improve in every area of my life. Everything. Sometimes I'm doing well and other times not. So it's just something that we always need to, to pursue God, His wisdom, and understanding of living the way that God wants to, us to. And that's part of proving that we're with wise, is to surrender and yield our life to Him in humility. And then a fifth characteristic is mercy. That's Jesus. That word describes Jesus. Compassion, mercy. God gives, given wisdom produces mercy. And mercy means that we look at people with compassion, even though that person may deserve punishment. That's a big deal. Suppose your spouse deserves punishment for something awful they have done. But with God's mercy within us, we look at that person with compassion and love that will overcome that person's mistake. That's a big, big deal. That's, God's asking a lot from us. It's not automatic or natural for us. It's natural for us to argue, to judge, to want to punish. And the same goes with our children and our in-laws or our supervisor or co-workers. And here in the church community, so many times people do deserve punishment, but with God's spirit within us, we look at that person with compassion. That's amazing. And now number six, James says, godly wisdom displays fruit of good deeds. A person who has godly wisdom produces action. Godly wisdom puts mercy to work. You will see people jump at the chance to serve God, to be ready and willing to put their God-given talents to good use. And we have that here at DICC. I 
see people jump in there. When we need volunteers for something, people will volunteer. That's called God's godly wisdom. We develop that within us. Whenever we have that desire to, to do, to serve. And by the way, this morning I spotted a beautiful bulletin board out there with a beautiful scripture on it. And I asked, who did this? Who did this? And I thought, I wonder who made that. And again later, Ginny told me that Cindy had made that beautiful bulletin board. It is beautiful. And that's godly, godly wisdom. And I love that scripture, by the way. And now, number seven, James says, God-given wisdom shows no favoritism. Wow. No favoritism. Is that easy? No, it's not. It's not easy for us. No, it's not. Showing no favor favoritism means that God given wisdom, God's word, when we follow this, No matter what, we follow the fixed principles of God's Word. Not meaning, oh, I will follow, but then if something else comes up that maybe, you know, leads us into cheating or... No, we set our principles on God's Word and we never, never compromise the truth of the scripture. That doesn't mean that we become extremely legalistic, must have a tie and certain clothing, and it also doesn't mean we become extremely compromising. There's a fixed principles of God's truth. Not the kind that Like, I don't really uh, support that, but um, I'll do it this time for you. No, it's hard. It really is hard. But showing no favoritism means that this is God's truth. This is God's word. And if you ask me to do something, no matter if it's a spouse or a child, our best friend, and they ask me to do something that's antithetical to God's word, I'll say, I love you, but I'm not going to do that. No. We don't compromise God's truth. The truth is the truth. We need to teach that person. I can't do that because it's wrong. It's against God's word. Does that make sense? And eighth, God's wisdom is sincere. His wisdom will help us to avoid hypocrisy. That our everyday life will be sincere and that our everyday lifestyle will match that of God's Word. That we're the same on Sunday as we are on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And it is hard and a challenge. And if you feel that way, we need to ask for God's wisdom to indwell us. We should be the same in our home as we are outside our home. If 
if you're in a good mood outside your home, you should be in a good mood in your home. A bad mood outside your home? Well, you shouldn't be in a bad mood. Yeah. You can live with challenges and maybe not feel good without becoming moody about it and angry. Just pray for God's wisdom to indwell you and to have the same behaviors in the home as outside the home. To not be friendly outside the home and then when you're in the home angry and easily upset, kicking the cat around. You know what I'm talking about, right? I'm guilty too, of course. We all face the same things. So now, here's some million dollar questions for us. Which side are you on? Unwise or wise? Do you side with the unwise? Or do you side with the wise? Do you struggle with other people's successes? Do you pursue personal desires at the cost of peace? Do your inward feelings and your outward actions hurt the people around you? Is your life full of disorder because you're just chasing petty pursuits? Do you pursue the things of the world rather than the things of God? Or does your life show gentleness and humility? Do people know you as a person that's authentic? Do you act the same in your home? as you do at work and in school? Do you build other people up and rejoice when they are successful? Or do you become jealous? Do you put the needs and interests of others ahead of your own? Do you sow the seeds of peace and joy wherever you go? So here's the challenge for you and for me as well. And it's from James. Try your best to answer these questions truth truthfully. Don't fool yourself. Be truthful with yourself. If you don't answer the way you wish you were, I want you to ask yourself, would your family and friends answer these questions about you the same as you would? If you feel you align yourself with the wise, give, give God your thanksgiving and praise because you did not become that way yourself. It's His Spirit working within you, molding you throughout your life. But if you think you align, are aligning yourself with the unwise, ask, ask God for wisdom. He says in His Word, if you lack wisdom, to ask me and I will give it to you. God is happy to help us to change. We can't do it ourselves. We can't do it without God. I promise it, you, it's impossible. Perhaps you need to repair a broken relationship. Do it. Maybe you need to drop a selfish ambition. Then stop it. 
Maybe you need to start praying and worshiping. Then start now. It's never, ever too late to start doing the right things. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray for wisdom and we thank you that you have invited us to ask you for wisdom. I pray that every person here can look at themselves in a positive way and see the areas that they need to grow and to then be willing to ask you for your wisdom and your